morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Energy Speaks Back, powered by B2B Energy. My name is Paul Webb, and I'm the founder of B2B Energy, and I'm also your host. And weekly, I present to you energy experts from around the world. Welcome to episode 120. And our purpose, as always, is to provide a good understanding of energy management knowledge from around the world, which is available today for us to deliver savings that impact on our planet. We would like to thank utility people who are creating a better career and future for people within our industry. I'd also like to thank Esther Energy, who are our certificate partners. My guest today is the president of Brevian Energy, and he talks about PV solar, microgrids, and renewable energy. So without any further ado, I give you Rod Matthews. Good morning, Rod. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Paul. How are you today, sir? Yeah, very good. And it's good morning from you and good evening from me. And how about that? You know, we love technology, how we can communicate where it's uh, evening for you and morning for me. I love it. Yeah. I like the, the the seamless side of it. You could be, we could be in the same studio right this second, couldn't we? Yep. Absolutely. Could be sitting yeah. right next to each other. Exactly. And you, you sound perfect in my ears. Um, the sound is, is very good. So thank you for... Um, having a good system there to enable our listeners today. So, um, Rod, whereabouts are you based? I am in Southern California in San Diego, beautiful, sunny San Diego right now. It yeah. wasn't that way a few weeks ago. It was pretty rainy and, and dreary, kind of looked like uh, uh, Seattle or uh, parts of parts of England <laughs> in the wintertime. Newcastle or somewhere like that for us <laughs> exactly. up, up exactly. in the north. Yeah, Exactly. Have you been to the UK? I have not, unfortunately. I'm looking forward to making the trip here uh, soon, actually. Right. Excellent. Well, you would have to make sure you come to London and meet me. I, I really get excited when I, when I meet up with people I've actually interviewed from many miles Absolutely. away. Absolutely. I'll definitely look you up when I get there. Brilliant. And have you seen signs of climate change and the differences in weather? You mentioned the differences just now. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Uh, I was just recently, I'm originally from Louisiana. Uh, and I was just back there, what, last week? And I don't think I've ever seen it that hot, ever. Really? Uh, and humid. It was really, it was miserable. I mean, there are heat warnings, heat, heat indexes, you know, telling you if, you if you don't need to be outside, don't go. And if wow. you're inside, if at all possible, get under some kind of air conditioning. It is just that hot and miserable there. So we're seeing, uh, just looking at the news this morning, uh, on the East Coast, New York, Connecticut, some of our east eastern seaboard uh, states, massive flooding over the past few weeks right. to go along with record heat uh, that was going along uh, right before that. Yeah. So we're seeing uh, here in San Diego, where you know we very seldom you know get a lot of rain. Uh, it was one of the the rainiest years we've ever seen. We had a lot of flooding. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of snow packs. Uh, they had snow in areas like 20 feet tall. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, we never see that. So no. to you've say had, that you've had extreme, climate change. You've had very, extreme seasons in each case. Very much so. Very much so. So we we knew we do see that climate change is real. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Uh, it really uh, helps motivate me even more because one of our missions for what we do at Brevian Energy is we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to right. kind of slow down the effect uh, of these, the, the climate change and, you know, the potency of it that we see going on every day. Yeah, yeah. So it's a motivator for you in your Absolutely. Your yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's really why we started doing this anyway. And uh, everyone here that's associated with us, uh, we really have that mission. Uh, so yeah. it's more than just about making money for us. No. Uh, for us, it's you know, being fiduciary, have a fiduciary responsibility to the company to make money. But our overall goal is to try to uh, do what we can to try to avert, reverse the effects of climate change. Yeah. I'm going to touch on that more later, but um, for the benefit of our audience, today, can you give us your background and talk us about your, your origin story and what led you into this, this sort of uh, action? I, I would say I came from a non-traditional route. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I was in the United States Navy after serving wow. nine years in the Navy as an electronics technician. 
Uh, I got out of the Navy and uh, I was into doing networking. Uh, so working with a lot of, uh, you know, medical device companies and, uh, you know, small and medium sized companies, helping them get a handle on their networking uh, kind of led me into working with data centers, helping them uh, reduce their carbon footprint, helping them get a better handle on their energy situation. And I was introduced to microgrids and doing that. And as soon as I was introduced to it, I mean, like a light bulb for me just went off like, man, this is yeah. the key. This is the answer for a lot of the problems that we're having right now. Uh, so from that, I hooked up uh, with my partner who has 30 years of experience uh, working in a nuclear power plant here at uh, San Onofre in, in uh, San Diego. He's done everything from an operator to leading the union to having uh, a lot of government relations. So, you know, partnering with him, really kind of uh, getting uh, more versed on microgrids and the different technologies that comprise them. And, you know, we set out to start a company. Unfortunately, we started a company about four months before COVID, <laughs> which didn't as, help much. As you do, <laughs> as you do. You couldn't have expected that to happen. Not at all. Yeah. But it actually, it, it gave us an opportunity to kind of sit back and evaluate the partnerships that we were going to make, yeah. uh, kind of help us vet out our business model, uh, gave us the opportunity to talk to a lot of people that we couldn't talk to because nobody can go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that helped from that aspect. And really as of about, you know, last year, we really kind of started getting rolling out there. Uh, so we've been making an impact. Uh, we haven't slowed down. We've been really kind of focusing on uh, small to medium sized companies that fall within say a hundred kilowatts to up to a megawatt. Cause we feel like they're kind of underserved. And also we've been focusing attention on uh, LMI or lower to moderate income communities, uh, looking at some, you know, community-based projects to help people who can't afford to deploy these technologies individually, but yeah, yeah. collectively as a, as a community, community so. that can benefit yeah, yeah. from it. Brilliant. We cannot go any further in this podcast without diving back. I like going back. Um, tell me about the Navy. What were you doing there? Oh, um, I was an electronics technician in the Navy. I was on the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, we pre, I pre, pre-commissioned that ship. I was one of the first crew members uh, assigned to the ship before it was even really built. Right. And did you go out with it? Um, how far did you get? I, I did. I went as far as it, I went as far as it did. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, We're about so to yeah, made, made two deployments. I made it. A, you know, the ship was built in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And it changed and established a home port in Alameda, California. Right. So on an aircraft carrier, you know, we can't go through the Panama Canal, you know, so you have to go all the way around is South it too, America. Is it too big to go through the Panama? It's too big, that, too right. big to go through the Panama Canal. So wow. we have to sail all the way around the, the tip of South America to come around to the other side of, 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 a, of the United States. So that was a very interesting voyage. A lot of people don't get a chance to do that in the Navy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we got a chance to do that. Go to places like Brazil and Chile, and uh, so yeah, we loved it. Uh, then it I did been, a, a deployment. Um, that must be quite exciting. Was it quite active with the jets and things? Oh, very active with the jets. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a floating airport, right? And really, it's a floating city with an airport attached. Yeah, to yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, it was very did interesting. You, uh, did you ever get a chance a to stand on top when there was the taking off and things? That must be amazing. Um, no, when they're taken off, not really. Unless you really work it's up restricted, there. Restricted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When they're taken off, unless you have specific business to do up there, because it's a very dangerous environment. A lot of moving yeah, yeah. parts. So if you're not if you're not up there and have somebody coordinating your movements, then you shouldn't be up there at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but getting a chance to be up there, you know, without all that stuff going on, yeah, all the time, got a chance to do that. Brilliant. I'm so jealous. I love that. I love I love airplanes and uh, the RAF and the jets and things. But yeah, what amazing that yeah, standing was, up on that experience. deck. So I stood on the deck. There's a uh, the ship in um, in New York, isn't there? That's an aircraft carrier, but that's mm -hmm. probably nowhere near as big as what you was on. No, yeah, those are the old older ones. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And how long was you there? Oh, I was uh, on that ship for five years, and wow. I. I was in the Navy for nine years. Right. And then you've done your time and you transitioned out into a civilian. 
Yep. And, you know, I was here in San Diego and I don't know if you've ever been to San Diego. No, but it's love, really hard. It's on my, it's it's on really my hard, bucket list. It's really hard to leave this place. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty hard to leave. Right. It's pretty hard to afford to stay here, but it's pretty hard to leave once you do get here. What What is the, the draw there? Uh, I mean, perfect weather, great people, you know, one lovely environment. You're, you know, literally, uh, no matter where you live in San Diego, you're no more than 30 minutes from the beach. You're no more than 45 minutes to the mountains. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So you can literally ski and go surfing on the same day. Brilliant. <laughs> Did you ski? I don't do either. <laughs> but you but if you if you wanted to if you, you wanted options. to if the opportunity was there you could do it that's why you love it absolutely. yeah yeah absolutely love it. and i'm going to touch on something else because you mentioned your business partner is in was in nuclear um mm -hmm. nuclear industry that's where i come mm -hmm. from um mm -hmm. so um it'd be great to catch up with him one day and talk about nuclear power because obviously i i worked in nuclear power for a long time myself just be be prepared for a long conversation oh same here <laughs> where you'd be asleep before the end of the conversation I'm sure. oh yeah i'd definitely leave you two just going at it i, I wouldn't be there with this. <laughs> does it interest in you you know when you heard it the first time did it interest you the story Absolutely. about yeah yeah, but I mean, I've heard his story quite a bit, so I don't, I don't need to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> please. Was that a please that you put in there? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so tell us more about what you're doing now regarding the new business. Again, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, our core focus is uh, companies that are small to medium size that, you know, have a peak demand of about anywhere from about 100 kilowatts to just under a, a megawatt. Uh, because we feel that they're underserved. There's been a lot of attention paid to residential customers, you know, at the home level, um, you know, here in San Diego, you know, we have several companies that are really focusing on that. Yeah. And at the large scale utility, you know, 10, you know, the multi megawatt kind of deal, we have a lot of companies that are focused on that providing utility scale power, but we don't have a lot of companies that are really focused on that small to medium sized market, yeah. uh, which here in San Diego is really the, the predominant mixture of companies here. Right. Uh, we only have a, you know, a couple of like fortune 500 type companies here in San Diego. Uh, but the predominant, you know, company size is uh, small and medium size, you know, less than a hundred employees and have that demand, you know, like we talked about, you know, it'd be that manufacturing companies. Uh, we have a lot of medical device companies here, a lot of wireless companies here, uh, industries here. Uh, so those companies are, you know, a lot of startups, and those smaller type companies, warehouse logistics. So we, we feel that uh, that those are, are very uh, great targets for us. Yeah. And where do you start? What's the starting point with these customers? Uh, really, we, you know, we kind of take a look at, um, you know, the, the, the size and the industry, and we can kind of get a feel for what the demands are. And, and really for us, it's really at that point, getting past the gatekeepers and it's an education process really because yeah. if i told you i can come to you and save you about a third on what you're spending right now from the you know investor owned utilities plus make it so that you know it's the likelihood of you losing power is significantly reduced and mm -hmm. oh by the way you're helping save the planet if i yeah. tell you you can do all of those i mean number one saving money that's the first thing you care about you don't really care about you know exactly. a lot of people don't they That's could care priority. about two and three. That's your priority, but, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So number one, save your money. Two, give you better, a better quality of power, more resilient power, and helping you save the planet to be more responsible at the same time. So if we can bring all of those three in, uh, in most cases, nobody's gonna say no to that. And uh what we like to do is is work with a power purchase agreement. Uh so the customer really they don't have to spend any money up front, no capex, uh, and they just agree to start off taking power from us when we start producing it yeah, uh, yeah. for about 20 to 25 years is, which is the same kind of relationship they have right now with the investor owned utilities. All they really care about is they turn on the switch and the light comes on. They don't really care how that happens. And where is the, the grid, the subgrid actually connect? Is it on their building or is it adjacent to the building or is it, they part of the network? How does that work? It really depends on how they're set up. Uh, you know, 
right now, one of the major problems here in America is there is a delay, uh, extreme delay in some cases on the connection queue to get connected to the grid, right? Yeah. It could be, it could take up to four years in a lot of cases. Uh, so they have- our, Whether our you're federal, renewable or not. No, no, well, it doesn't matter, yeah. So yeah, yeah. renewable, non-renewable, it doesn't so really If I matter. wanted to build a building and then connect it in, I'm going to have a delay, yeah? Wow. It's going to be a delay, absolutely, particularly on the commercial side. Now, uh, some of these communities, like I talked about, uh, these LMI or rural-based communities, they get like priority queue position before you. So yeah, instead yeah. of waiting four years, it could be like nine months. Right. But we have the ability with what we do, uh, we can build a system that doesn't require you to be even connected to the grid. And you can right. generate your own power until that grid connectivity becomes available. And right. then at that point, it's only, you know, you can use it to generate additional revenue or use it as a backup. But yeah. we can have you islanded producing your own power without having to, you know, wait that four or five years. to. So you to have like going. a private wire straight into the building. Absolutely. The- it's at that point, if it's not grid connected, uh, yeah. semantically, it's called a mini grid instead of a micro grid. Right. So at the point that you, that you do have that grid connectivity, it then becomes a micro grid. Right. But you're islanded. You can be producing your own power with a lot of different types, types of technology, depending on your your location, your space size, and all of that. That we can totally have you generating your own electricity. So you mentioned um, technologies. What are the ranges of technologies that you focus on? Uh, primarily, we use PV solar, uh, you know, as a generating asset during the daytime. We use uh, uh, LFP or lithium ferrous phosphate batteries. Uh, because they're more efficient and they don't have the fire hazard. Right. Uh, we use uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Okay. Uh, and they can uh, provide base load power for, you know, mission critical assets. Uh, we can use uh, wind turbines in the mix. Uh, we can use geothermal. Uh, you know, we can use hydro. So there are a host of different, you know, I, diesel generators. Although, yeah. you know, our, our goal isn't to use diesel generators, but in some cases, particularly in mini grid situations as a, uh, a tertiary backup, you know, we could have uh, generators, be they, you know, natural gas or diesel or, or whatever, and, you know, try to use them experimentally as possible, but at least have them there as a part of it. Yeah. In fact, most micro grids uh, to this point are done with diesel generators. Right. Uh, so we're trying to trying to change that to make that with renewable assets, but uh, that could be a part of the mix as well. But, but we, we try to limit that as much as possible. With diesel generators, there are solutions available, biodiesel, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. And take away sin gas and all kinds of different uh, yeah. opportunities to do with that. So yeah, yeah. our but our it's goal a good is leg to up, isn't it? Do... It's a good leg up and the starting point and say an entry level into, you know, you, you're looking at a building that needs power. You need to get in there quick. So maybe the the, the uh, diesel gen is that's just, just your point one. And as long as you've got a, a roadmap to migrate that, then why yes. not start that way? Yeah, absolutely. We're not opposed to that. You know, we want to get, our, our goal is to get to the end result. Yeah. And there are a lot of different ways you can do that. And, yeah. you know, a lot of different combinations. You know, there's an old saying, and I know people get tired of hearing saying this, but if you've seen one microgrid, you've seen one microgrid because they're all different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going to ask a question. Case, one one solution doesn't fit all, does it? You've got many not at many all. solutions. Yeah. I mean, there are different space requirements. There are different, you know, mission criticalities uh, based on you know what a company does. You know, some company could maybe afford to be down for four hours and not a big deal. Some mm-hmm. company can't afford to be down four minutes because they'd yeah. lose massive revenues, exactly. or you know, somebody's life is on the line. So it really depends on what, what how, you think. Your um. What do you think your challenges are? Uh, number one is really kind of establishing what the requirements are. That's, you know, number one. Uh, and particularly a system that is brand new. Uh, you know, it's easier to come in if you have historical information on, you know, somebody who's been in operation for 20 years. They really know yeah. what they need. Yeah. But the challenge is building something new where you're kind of anticipating what's going to be the demand yeah. and you don't really yeah. know. So those are really the, the the challenging aspects, but that's what makes this fun as well. You know, it, it uh, kind of helps you to, you know, utilize all of your resources. Uh, you have to engage with a lot of different people to really understand what the requirements are in, in every aspect of the organization. So that's where uh, that collaboration within an organization is really essential. 
for me, it, you, you're going to go in there with all different solutions. So, you know, you're going to be scratching your head for a while before you actually decide how you're going to do that. And data is yeah. key in the beginning, as you say. If you've got a new building, new new requirements, you've got no data to work on. Is data easy to get hold of in in um, San Diego? Uh, um, depends. Again, uh, if it's an existing situation, yeah, that data is pretty easy to get a hold of because they're going to be uh, have been working with the local utility, and there's only one here in San Diego. Right. Uh, so we have an application that we use that uh, kind of interfaces with uh, several. Uh, investor-owned utilities and allow us to pull their interval information or what's called green button data. Uh, so every 15 minutes, uh, there is a snapshot of your energy usage taken. Right. So, and there's two components of your bill, right? There is the, your energy that you consume at a rate that you consume it, you pay for that. But what most people don't even realize is that you actually get charged for the amount of power that's available for you to use. Yeah, available. That's called a demand charge. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that's that's measured in those 15 minute periods. Every 15 minutes there's a snapshot taken. So your highest usage in a 15 minute or your highest demand or power made available to you in a in a 15 minute period over a month's time is how you get charged for that. Yeah. And that's usually about a third of your bill is that demand charge let alone your consumption. Uh, and here in San Diego, we have what's called time of use. So you don't get like a flat rate of X, just say 10 cent. You don't get that. You get one time uh, what's called uh, off peak. That's in the morning time from like 7 a.m. to 3.59 p.m. Then you get what's called peak at 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. where you are charged, you know, at least twice, at least double of what you're charged during the peak time. Yeah. And yeah. then in the evening time, you have like the super off peak where they encourage you to charge your vehicles and that kind of stuff because that's the lowest rate at yeah. that time. Yeah. Tell me, um, so obviously um, you have different states and the state you're talking about is San Diego and that is where California. the- California. Mm -hmm. California state, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not really good with my state, so I do apologize. So tell me, where does that energy come from? Is it within California? Is that is that uh, state on its own ring as such? Or well, we're here in San, come across in, in San Diego. There are really like three major utility companies. Uh, right. Here in San Diego, we have uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. So right. they provide, they are the providers of our energy here in San Diego County. Right. And I might add that San Diego Gas and Electric has the highest rates in all of America, including our two. What, and why is uh, that? Uh, because they can, uh, <laughs> because they've been approved yeah? to do so. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely a mop monopoly. Yeah, uh, in this area. And do they which push, is why do they push electricity to? Do they push electric electricity to other parts, other states, or you? No, they're you they're just they're just San Diego County. Right. Right. So San Diego County only they're operating. They have you know, certain variations of parts of uh, Orange County. A uh, little bit of parts of Riverside County are in there, but primarily they're just San Diego County. I must have done some research on this many years ago, and I knew it wasn't like the UK where we've got a whole complete open grid where we can trade our energy, we can buy from all different. We've got competitors, you know. I think there's about mm -hmm. 19 suppliers. But obviously, That's like Texas. Yeah. Texas right. is like that. Yeah, so some of, the, some of the American states have copied the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, so it all depends on where you are. So are you only doing this this work currently in San Diego? Well, our projects right now have been in San Diego, but we're looking at projects all over all over the country. Yeah, yeah. Fact. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we have the ability to work anywhere. But uh, again, here in San Diego, we have the highest utility rates in the country. So, you know, we have a lot of... Uh, a lot of potential customers right here in our yeah. own backyard. Every time you're talking, I'm thinking of these words. I was going to say, you, you might as well just work in your backyard to start with before you can start, you know, because hey. if you can't get it right yeah. in your backyard, you're never going to get it right. Are you? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, we want to get our business model perfected, uh, you know, get this thing down pat before we take it to the world. Yeah. 
I was going to just about to touch on that. Can can this be driven across um, the globe? Is there any absolutely? Percent? And you know, the some of the places that we're really looking at are these emerging markets as well, like in Africa, Central America, where mm-hmm. they don't they haven't made the initial investments in all of these big grids to begin with. So yeah. you know, there something like microgrids can help them easily get electrification in a lot of the rural areas uh, and give them a lot of stability. Uh, you know, most of these places you go, you know, they're just, I mean, it's just common practice that, oh, it's four o'clock. Oh, we've, the, the grid's going to go, we're going to lose power here for about an hour. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like commonplace and nobody scratches their heads. Like, no there's a lot of downtime, isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we do see opportunities in those markets. Uh, there are concerted efforts right now uh, uh, collaborations between our government and some of the African nations as well, looking to uh, bring over these technologies. So some of these emerging markets are uh, certainly targets for us, again, because we feel we can do good. You know, I was watching a documentary maybe a year ago or so, and I was watching something that, was something that really struck me, said that the presence of electricity uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee success, but the absence of electricity absolutely guarantees failure and poverty. So in these areas, you know, these tribal areas, these villages, they have no electricity. You're going to find poverty. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, where, um, so I was going to ask as well, do, do you need legislation? Um, is there some sort of license that you have to have to do this? Uh, I mean, well, you know, electrical licenses, of course, you know, there are some regulations around this, but. I mean, I think the most uh, impactful thing that's happened to this whole industry here, particularly in America, uh, was over the past uh, couple of years with two things. Uh, there was a, an infrastructure bill that was recently passed by the Congress and uh, pushed through by President Biden. And uh, recently, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which in- increased these credits, uh, made uh, tax credits transferable. Uh, that in and of itself has poured fuel uh, on the fire that is the renewable energy market. So between, like I say, the infrastructure bill uh, really puts a lot of money into communities and municipalities to help them upgrade their systems. And the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, help, you know, individual companies and individual citizens, you know, claim more on their uh, in their tax credits and, you know, make these tra- tax credits transferable, particularly for like nonprofits who don't have the tax liability anyway, uh, right. to be able to uh, work with a project to sell those tax credits to a company using looking to claim those and for direct cash can really help fund these projects. So uh, a lot of these projects now up to 60 to 70% of them are paid for with public and private money. Right. So you get funding for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we talked about your challenges. What, what what's your plans for the future regarding what you're doing? Apart from doing more and more of what you're doing, again working with you know targeting uh, the companies like we said the uh, small and medium sized companies, helping them save money. Um, you know, which all of those can help them stay afloat. You know, energy challenges here in San Diego, the cost of energy. Um, we saw a few years ago. Uh, when we first start seeing, you know, massive spikes in electrical costs during the summertime, literally drove companies out of business because they couldn't afford to pay their power. No, no. So if we can we can make that predictable. If we can uh, lower those costs for them, if we can uh, provide them power where they don't have to send their employees home, you know, three, four times a year because they can't operate because they don't have power. Uh, if we can do that for them, give them more stability uh, in the long run, we think. It helps make them to be more viable. So is the grid majority uh, fossil fuel, the gas? And oh, no absolutely. Salt? Absolutely. You know, hence coal that, fired hence, plants. Hence that why the, the price has gone up. Yeah, so you, absolutely. You've been affected by the, the Russian and Ukraine prices. Absolutely. On it. Absolutely. It impacted the whole world. Yeah. And just not even just from a price standpoint, we see it as a security issue as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, that's why we really push for decentralization on the grid by having microgrids deployed in mass. Yeah. So no one incident can take out a whole area. Yeah. That's brilliant. So 
it's come to that time. I don't know if you've listened to any of my podcasts, but it's where I put you on the spot. You've already been on the spot. So thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> no problem. Is there something you can give back to our industry today? You know, we have quite a few um, experts listening to our, our call today. Is there anything that you can give them um, as a takeaway for their role within this industry? This is something that everyone can be a part of, right? I mean, we all live on the same planet. I don't care if you're black, white, Republican, Democrat, man, woman. We all breathe the same air. We all live under the same sun, you know. Uh, So we're all going to be affected the same ways. I don't care if you're rich, poor, whatever. Uh, So number one, we should all be thinking of ways we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? We need to reverse the effects of climate change. Yeah. I'm looking at it from an energy standpoint, but it could be you just fo- focus more on recycling, focus more on uh, using products that are, you know, uh, more eco friendly. Uh, so I think we we have to have that as a priority uh, for all of us, not just some of us. Everybody needs to take yeah. part in this because not just some of us are going to benefit from the earth not getting too hot. Yeah. And it, it's not everyone that works in the industry. It's everyone in the world. Every, does yes, it, again. I, doesn't everyone. matter whether you're a policeman, you're working in a hospital, you're a school teacher. Doesn't everyone matter. can make that change. We all we breathe the same air. It doesn't. It's exactly. not like uh, you know, rich people breathe this air and poor people breathe this air. We all breathe the same air. I like the fact you you said Republicans and uh, what was the other one? Republicans, Democrats, Democrats. That's very American. I yeah, the said, House of Lords of Commons either. Yeah, you know I mean, Lords <laughs> of Commons, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I would have said whether you're conservative or Labour, that's that's our sort of colours. And it's the same as there you. you you're, you're red and blue as well, aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, what's funny is they're red and blue and like the two most uh, notorious gangs in a, in a country, the Crips and Bloods are red and blue. So I, they remind me of exactly the same. Yeah. They're so, you know, those they're so tribal. Uh, you know, if 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 you wear that color, I have nothing to do with you. <laughs> but again, it doesn't we're, matter. We we're still the same with the same football. Era. We have the same with football. So um, is your is San Diego a Biden area? It has become so. Uh, it used to be more conservative. Right. Uh, but I would say over the past 10, 15 years, it's, it's starting to lean a little bit more liberal. Right. Oh, interesting. So would you guys please that Biden got in? Um, I'm not putting you on the spot. I don't normally a, like talking about politics, but I find it very as, interesting. As America. someone who is in the renewable energy space, I yeah. am ecstatic yeah. that President Biden has come in with his focus on remaking our grid. Uh, his yeah. whole administration, that, that has been a key focus, again, between the infrastructure bill that was passed and the Inflation Reduction Act, which put a lot of emphasis on this. Yeah. I mean, I don't, like, again, I don't care if I was the, uh, the biggest Republican in the world. But I'm in this industry and the things that the legislation that's been passed and the uh, effort that that's been made from his administration has really helped to propel this industry forward. Yeah. So I'm ecstatic from that, from that standpoint. I like that word. So Rod, I really like to thank you for your time today. It's been brilliant. I love your voice. You sound like, no, I shouldn't really say this. You do sound like Will Smith. Is that, is he from <laughs> your area? No, or he's actually like- from, he's from Philadelphia. I'm from Louisiana. All but right. ironically enough, when I was a kid, you know, uh, before my beard was white, um, people used to say I used to look like him. But, yeah, you do. Uh, you do. I, yeah. I look like him. Uh, maybe a homeless Will Smith, probably. <laughs> I look like a homeless. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. Well, Rod, look, thank you very much. It's been really interesting listening to your story. Um, I wish you a lot of um, sort of luck and, and, and sort of focus on that and uh, you've got the i can feel the passion all the way across the pond so uh, i well, wish you really well with that thank you paul like again you know we, we have a mission here to uh, we like to say to save the planet one watt at a time yes and you know we'd like you to come back you, you know give it six months come and give a come on with your partner so we can talk some nuclear stuff as well so yeah i think, I, I think i'll introduce call. you to and I'll, I'll i'll have something else to do at that point yeah <laughs> <laughs> well rod please you and your family stay safe in these times and thank you very much thank you thank you paul i really appreciate being on i really enjoyed the conversation today 